Okay, welcome to your free food. Um, I'm Peter Krapp, and I teach, as you heard at the beginning of the summer, in three departments, Film and Media Studies, where I mostly do new technologies, digital media, the English department, where I do whatever I want, and I'm affiliated with informatics, where I mostly focus on computer games. Um, Paul told you everything about our project last week, so I'm just here to take questions. <laughs> Nobody wants to uh, interrupt chewing, so I'll go on until you're done chewing. Um, this project is taking on way too much. I'll say that right up front. Uh, this project is actually uh, inspired by somebody in Switzerland who decided that he was going to take on way too much. Uh, a social scientist, a sociologist in Zurich, um, who decided that he was going to build a living earth simulator. You know, something that you know from science fiction since the 1970s. Right? Uh, Douglas Adams, for instance, uh, has uh, the whole earth uh, be a simulation that's run by mice, and we are just part of the experiment. Uh, Dirk Helping very seriously proposed that the European Union to provide him with 1 billion euros in research funding, which to my knowledge is the largest ever grant written. And later this month we'll find out whether he's going to be funded for the Living Earth Simulator. Um, today I brought you way too much. Uh, I brought you lots of slides. Um, most of them are just pictures, some of them are wordy though. Um, and even a little clip, and I'm mostly going to be talking to you about various trends in the history of simulation that allow us to understand what the stakes are when somebody says, <clears throat> I'm going to revolutionize not just the hard sciences that have been using simulators and computers for a long time, but the soft sciences, the messy sciences, the social sciences, because what's really at stake here is um, he says, a way to unify all the different academic efforts, all research efforts, to make tractable the, the messy problem that come about when you're not dealing with a very well-defined small area in genetics or um, in uh, simulating certain physics or collision detection or <coughs> in material science or whatever it might be, but human-made, man-made, people-made, mass media problems, social media problems. Right? Um, and a lot of people worry that the main problems that we do face are all uh, caused by humans. Uh, not necessarily because we're bad people, but because there's a lot of us. And we're not very good at coordinating so that we mitigate certain impacts that we have. Right? So it's, it's a one billion euro program to explore social life on Earth and everything it relates to. A, pro a, pro a project that simulates everything. And he says, just as physics has super particle colliders for studying the universe's most fundamental bits of matter, right, the famous Large Hadron uh, Collider, uh, he wants to have a large knowledge collider uh, that simulates everything that we know, uh, that combines different threads of research on human and natural worlds. So, in about five stories, I'm going to tell you something about the history of simulation from uh, early mechanical models, like the kind of bucking bronco thing that you can find in the bar <coughs> so, that used to be used to train people uh, to fly planes, all the way to um, online, massively multiplayer games that simulate uh, behavior and a couple of steps in between. So if you look at the description of the project, um, it points into about two major strands in computer history and simulation. One of them is an increasingly powerful and profitable entertainment use of simulations that we know as games, that we know as training simulators. Um, and there's also new vistas in other disciplines. Right? As you know from some of the other projects here that use the word simulation, or as you know, if you uh, look at what's happening in education, what's happening in online training, um, etc. So a little bit of a media history of simulation that goes back, oh, we have several hours here today, right? Mm -hmm. Let's go back several centuries. 
uh, wargaming, um, then about a century of flight simulators. Um, I have to apologize to Catherine that I couldn't take her. Uh, when, and Paul and I and another student of mine went to a flight simulator nearby in Anaheim. Um, radar screens, immersive graphic user interfaces, etc. So I'm not actually today presenting you any results or pretending that we're going to have results in five weeks. I'm really uh, hoping to raise some questions. And my methods are again different. You've heard about qualitative research and uh, survey design from some other um, um, participants here. This is mostly um, a historical project in information science. Different method, different way of making a question tractable. You could break it down generally in, in six steps. It's recognizing that there is a historical question or a need for historical knowledge. And then gather as much relevant information about the topic uh, as possible to formulate a more specific question that can lead you to a hypothesis that tentatively explains relationships between historical factors. Right? For instance, what do we learn from the long tradition of wargaming that is being used in Pentagon planning and thick games uh, at land, etc.? What do we learn from mechanical simulators and computers and computer history? How do these come together in somebody having the audacity to ask for one billion euros? Uh, from uh, a federal agency, right? Um, so then you try to be more rigorous and collect and organize your evidence. You try to verify the authenticity and veracity of information, of arguments, of their sources. Uh, you select, organize, and analyze those. And uh, eventually you try to draw conclusions and then report the conclusions in a meaningful narrative. Right? So a meaningful narrative doesn't mean a thousand and one nights you tell a story so that you don't have to die. Uh, but a little bit, it's like that, you know, you, you have a planetary problem, you have a planet-sized problem, and the solution to that, according to the defending, is we're going to build a planet-sized simulation so we can test. What if? What if? What if? Now, of course, uh, when I say audacity, you already can hear that I'm a little skeptical about the claims of that project. I'm a little skeptical about the claims for the paradigm shift I'm going to roll up the history of simulation a little bit to introduce equation-based modeling, which is uh, computational, about 70 years old, to introduce agent-based modeling, which is a little bit less uh, recent, uh, le less old, and then uh, most recently, Herbing says, we're going to totalize that. Um, the totalization is a little bit um, uh, questionable because as you can see very quickly in the history of simulation, it's very useful to simulate uh, behavior of a closed system. Right? You know what the controls of an airplane are going to do, as, at least as long as you pretend that the airplane is going to be in this controllable uh, flight envelope, and you don't have to worry with a flight trainer about all sorts of other things like weather conditions or uh, what an enemy might do to interrupt uh, the flight envelope of your plane. Right? First, you want to get the uh, pilot to be able to take the plane up for real without risking the plane, which is very expensive, or risking the pilot, which is also kind of expensive. Uh, for much more complex open systems, where it's obvious that you need to introduce all of these other uh, interferences, right? I'm not saying that in economics you're dealing with enemies or with weather, but you know, in economics or business or social sciences in general, you will deal with a lot of uh, open questions. You don't, you don't necessarily predict accurately how other uh, factors are going inter to interact. So it can be a very good tool for introducing beginners to a dynamic system's behaviors. It can be one of many ways to provide relatively simple, effective feedback, which is uh, you know, something that cybernetics has exploited for several decades of designing simulators. And we'll look at some of them. And it's also a good way to explore options or discuss the validity of underlying assumptions, which is why if you work in government or policy think tanks or business consulting, right, um, you're going to use models and simulators to design scenarios. You know, what if, what if, what if. Right? It's a daily bread of planning uh, in business or government. <clears throat> but you scale from a relatively simple model to a full-fledged simulation once 
you don't just have modeling of different interactions. Uh, you also have a relatively complex calculation introduced that tries to abstract that into mathematical formula equations, and then uh, a visualization of that. Since the 1940s, numerical simulation has accelerated a lot. Why is it the 1940s? Pretty obvious. It was an all-out effort in the Second World War, uh, and it was spurred by things that were already done, and had already been done for the First World War, but were urgently necessary in the Second World War. And there are basically three things that people needed much more powerful, much faster calculations for. The first one, in wargaming in general, is to say, if I have X number of troops, tanks, planes, uh, ships, and they have X number of, and I know, to the best of my knowledge, you know, this is their speed, this is their range, this is how they, well they trained, etc. And then I introduce weather, I introduce other uh, factors, I introduce what do I think they will do if they think I will do this. In theory, right? you come up with a very complex situation, and it would be great for decision makers in the field, as well as in politics, if they could decide relatively quickly, because the situation is fluid. Right? You can make a good decision if you can take six weeks and study the problem and get your spies or agents or newspapers to give you good information, but often you don't have a day. You've got to decide now. The second thing is, Second World War deals a lot more with ballistics, with fluid dynamics of, you know, uh, calculating the ballistics of a rocket that's trying to intercept a plane, or a plane that's trying to dodge a uh, flat or whatever. And those kinds of calculations are again, also, again, real time. And the calculating by hand or with an analog calculator is not fast enough, not good enough to say, our equipment does this, their equipment does that, how can we optimize it? So they wanted to accelerate the development of computing. And the third thing, as you know, was a very secret at first, uh, and then very, very public uh, effort to build uh, thermonuclear bombs. And that needed very, very complex calculations. So that really accelerated the development of the digital computer. As uh, von Neumann, who is a key figure in uh, all of these uh, efforts, both in Los Alamos and, and in Princeton and for the US government, said uh, later, looking back, our present analytical methods seem unsuitable for the solution of the important problems arising in connection with nonlinear partial differential equations, and in fact, with virtually all types of nonlinear problems. For that, simulations are better than other ways of predicting. And that's why he demanded that somebody give him enough support to build digital computers. And he was very influential in formulating uh, what digital computers should look like and how, how they should work. So first strand, let's look back a little bit. Of course, you know that chess and Chaturanga and other games abstract the battlefield, abstract rules of behavior, train people in predicting, train people in um, analyzing strategically and tactically uh, what's possible, what's, uh, what's likely, what's probable. Um, and uh, into the 19th century, they, they were very popular, not just as abstract games as for entertainment, but also as very detailed training games, tabletop or floor games. Um, they were, by the way, not um, questioned by parents as child appropriate <coughs> the way that we now discuss games. There was no question in the 19th century parents' mind. This was good for kids because it taught them how to think. Right? This was good for kids because it taught them how to see the whole problem in all of this complexity but have an overview. Right? Um, and then um, often Military and public policy advisors would bring people with experience from one of the several wars in the 19th century back to redesigning their training games. And uh, that inheritance went into tabletop and floor games used all the way into the 1940s. However, when von Neumann's computer definition took off, they kind of threw out the baby with the bathwater. They started think tanks like the Rand Corporation up in Santa Monica and other uh, places that heavily invested in making computers used for, for these, you know, make these problems tractable. And they threw out the tradition 
centuries of, of tradition of training policy advisors, military, uh, in tabletop and floor games, and it has a, a few drawbacks, and they realize that only several decades later. Um, they had to deal with flamboyant personalities. I tortured Paul with reading about all these uh, different people, including Herman Kahn, who uh, was a model for um, various film characters, including, of course, Dr. Strangelove. Herman Kahn became famous because he uh, wanted to think through, with the aid of computers, how many people could survive an all-out thermonuclear global uh, confrontation. Um, and he became, in fact, too famous for the Rand Corporation. They, they couldn't deal with the fact that one person would be uh, spearheading it. So he went off and started his own think tank on the East Coast. Um, Herman Kahn would confront generals who were skeptical of his computer-based modeling and simulation. And they said, you know, you don't have the experience in the field to make these kinds of recommendations to the president. And he said, how many, po uh, how many global thermonuclear wars have you fought? We fought 20 last week. You know, in simulation. And by the way, the University of California uh, has a tradition going back to the invention of the nuclear uh, weapons with three national labs that we manage for uh, the government. And uh, very clearly, a lot of the results that we now have in computer modeling, for instance, of weather, of global weather conditions, and of testing whether ideas about global warming are true or not, are accurate or not, what are learned, are developed in the three national labs because they had the expertise to model very complex dynamics, including weather conditions for a large-scale explosion. And then also got data from what a large-scale explosion of a nuclear device in Nevada or in the Bikinis uh, would do to the environment. So it was reintroduced, um, this tradition of wargaming into the military, and then, of course, also commercialized. Here's a 19th century game. Um, here's uh, more <coughs> pictures. Just recently, a colleague of mine who teaches uh, media studies, Alex Galloway, uh, teaches media studies at New York University, um, took one of those uh, board models and took it online and made it a, as he calls it, massively single-player online game. Um, <laughs> You know, in that, in that long tradition of, of strategic games. Uh, here you see planners at Rand in the late 50s. In the center is Daniel Ellsberg, who eventually became uh, very uh, notorious for leaking the Pentagon Papers to the New York Times. On the right, from the 60s, a comic strip that also um, uh, made well known that the military and the government were using tabletop uh, games to plan hypothetical wars to anticipate, you know, the what if, what if, what if. The second strand that goes into the story is a very kind of pedestrian training model of the simulator. You see some very uh, simple mechanical ones here. It's obviously risky and expensive to put uh, somebody who doesn't know how to fly into a real plane and have them uh, try to learn by doing. Um, Funny story that I tell my film students is that Charlie Chaplin's brother didn't really know what to do with himself, didn't have a, a way of making a living, but wanted to live off the fame of his actor and director brother. And so he would take all of these wealthy Hollywood types out for flight lessons in the, in the teens and twenties, where he basically sat in the pilot seat and he had them as passengers and he scared the living shit out of them. He took a lot of money. And people realized that's not a way to learn. You have to get your hands on the apparatus. So they built various devices that would give you feedback about, you know, if you do this, this that's what's going to happen. If you do that, this is what's going to happen. And of course, we still train pilots that way in relatively complex, but still um, abstract and stripped down uh, situations. And uh, even pilots who've been on, a, on, on the job for decades will still contractually be required to go back. And commercial airlines, for instance, always negotiate that. Recently, when United merged with Continental, the two unions had, the two uh, airlines had different conditions for how much training you have to do on the simulator in order to remain licensed to fly a commercial plane. This has a direct uh, relevance for computer simulation and computer modeling. 
because it was in fact in 1944 at MIT that Jay Forrester took the awkwardly named Airplane Stability and Control Analyzer and he renamed it Whirlwind, much cooler. Um, and it went digital a year later and it became very, very influential as an early digital computer. It was built out to uh, form an early warning system in 1948. Um, and then uh, it was by Coastal uh, where uh, they actually had visualization of incoming radar signals, for instance from Cape Cod, as you see in the next picture. Um, you schedule input and output, you have regular polling, and you don't have somebody sitting there 24-7 watching the coast. Are the English coming? Are the English coming? Uh, are the ca Canadian barbarians invading? Um, but you have a computer do that because the computers don't get bored, right? And they poll and they poll and they only alert you when they need human in the loop to make a decision about whether or not this is friend or foe, about whether or not this is close enough, about whether or not this is a, a missile, a plane, um, or whatever. So you have different radar uh, horizons that are overlapping and you can automate this and distribute it and pull in a large-scale computing installation. This is actually something, probably the power of this whole room would fit into your cell phone these days, but uh, this is something of a famous picture of the whirlwind because of its early and still round uh, radar display that the controller sits at. And this leads to be built out to the SAGE semi-automatic Round environment that basically teaches us how to make computers display information and how to have the display be addressable. Right? The display that you now take for granted, the screen that has pixels that you can address. It's important for playing computer games, it's important for working on computers, it's important for the tasks that the intercept technician had. In <coughs> the Cold War, with World War II over and now us turning our attention to the Russians, uh, we needed various ways to, one, uh, literally protect our skies, and two, to give our, the people of the U.S. Uh, sort of a feeling of security, and that's where SAGE came in. SAGE is the largest computer ever made, and uh, this is only one portion, and all of this is another portion, and we have less than 10% of one SAGE machine. First wide-scale use of modems was on this machine. And how it worked was you'd actually see a blip on the screen that was moving, and you would access that blip with a light gun by actually clicking on it. And if there was any information in air traffic control, it would show up in one area. But if not, the intercept technician would have to have it shot down. And the intercept technician would sit there, you know, pointing at their screen, not unlike um, video gamers in the 70s with their uh, consoles uh, or uh, TV uh, attached things that you later became uh, later became known as Spawn. But it was actually, again, a little bit of Los Alamos history that went into using that round screen for gaming. Uh, Willie Higginbotham had worked um, on the Eagle Radar display. He became a little bit of a uh, pacifist he stopped working on nuclear research, but he was still employed at Brookhaven National Lab. And one day, the people who control the purse strings were going to come visit, namely a congressional delegation. Congress people, elected politicians, don't always understand nuclear science. They don't know what actinides are. They don't know what destructive or other testing uh, could mean. They just want to know what they're getting for the money that they've been directing to Brookhaven and other national labs. So he decided on this five-inch oscilloscope, he's going to build them tennis for two. <laughs> a couple of buttons, and you can play a pixel over. And you have collision detection, you have sound. In other words, since 1958, we have the logic in place that we need uh, for computer games. This is, by the way, the display that you use. It's only part of a very large room filling uh, computer, of course. And then a few years later at MIT, for another visit of day, uh, students had gotten their hands on these machines, including Whirlwind, that I already mentioned, and other machines at Lincoln Lab near MIT. And they put a bouncing ball to display the speed and graphic capability of the machine on screen. Uh, another computer they turned into 
a music making machine, they looped control tones to play with redundancies, and they even used uh, an IBM machine as a light organ. So in other words, you have displays, addressable, sound, and uh, you turn it into the entertainment logic that we now know as Ma. Uh, all the way into the 60s, the logic of ping and pong still differs, right? Ping learned from sonar and radar, just testing, are you there, are you there, can you hear me now, can you hear me now, can you respond, uh, is there something, um, defines computer game as a game of computer against computer, or machine against machine, whereas a lot of hackers and students since the 60s and on have decided in favor for human computer interaction, in favor of Pong. Uh, they built Space War and other games on that basis. So of course in computer gaming we have a lot of what we call simulators. They're not defined as games in the same way that you don't have to have competition, you don't have to have an end state, you don't have to have um, uh, the same kind of rules that you would expect from a computer games. Uh, but maybe you simulate the politics, right? you simulate a world assembly, uh, global control, or you, you simulate the railway in uh, Riverside, or you simulate flight control, um, you know, the same as games, right? Um, has become an entertainment product, as well as something that helps in academia. The third strand from the 40s that I already mentioned was uh, fluid dynamics, nonlinear equations. Um, People who worked in Los Alamos and at Princeton uh, and at the uh, uh, Institute for Advanced Studies <coughs> near Princeton <coughs> discovered that once you use computers to solve these equations much faster than people were. Before, before you had those machines, by the way, computers were people. And so the name for those people were, would still be computers. There, were, there was a lot of clerks trying to calculate you know, what is going to happen if uh, it took them days or weeks or months, and even with the early computers, it took days and weeks and months to, uh, to solve, you know, what if we design the bottom this way? What if the weather is going to be that way? Um, but once they saw how that this uh, could ex be accelerated with computing, they also saw this is going to have applications for the largest and for the smallest systems we know, namely for molecular systems that now make biology uh, something completely different from what it was before the 1940s and for cosmology that uh, make uh, our understanding of the university, uh, on the, for the universe, <laughs> interesting slip, uh, different from what it was. Um, and with that, you get a shift away from just an equation-based model to an agent-based agent -based model, where you ascribe certain interactions to different parts. A good example of that, this is a recent book, it just came out earlier this year, uh, and I made Paul plow through it uh, with me, tells a very interesting story of how in the 1960s, people trained in cybernetics and modeling systems, complex systems, were hired by the uh, government of Chile to automate the country, um, to basically build a control room. It didn't have to have people in these chairs, by the way. A control room that would give all of the data um, uh, easy, easy visualization, right? uh, graphs, control panels that um, can give you the information in such a time that you can recognize a crisis and then avert it, you know, try to reduce the lag between those two, those two curves of real-time information and your reaction to them. So that, for instance, if there is an imbalance in the chemical sector in Chile, Chile is a big produ uh, producer of caoutchouc, you get the subsector here of caoutchouc, you get explications of the um, global production. Uh, how does this impact our uh, <coughs> pneumatic uh, industry, battery industry, vinyl industry, nylon industry, and um, photo uh, nylon, etc. And put that into a feedback loop and have the system automatically regulate at the optimal level. If there's more demand, maybe you can supply it. If there's less uh, supply, maybe you have to anticipate that that's going to impact uh, things. And you can, you can kind of extrapolate. So uh, this actually was never put into place because Silly uh, had a military revolution. 
and dictatorship uh, take over. Uh, but uh, over the year or so that uh, cybernetic revolutionaries worked in Chile, uh, they were very seriously engaged in turning an entire country's operation you know, at the top level of policy advising and making decisions, uh, industrial and other decisions, um, into a fully simulated system. 1972, July. Um, and this uh, can lead us very directly into the fourth, second to last strand, second to last story, namely how all of those people who were then basically evicted from Chile, they went to the US, they went to uh, Europe, they went, some of them went into academia, some of them went into business, and basically brought us what discipline that works with graphs and predictions, the consultant, right? You know, is there any industry that works without consultants? <laughs> Business consultants, strategy consultants. Um, you know, they don't read your hand anymore, uh, or look at your tongue, or feel your pulse. Uh, they don't read the entrails of a poor cat or a bird or whatever. Um, they don't read the stars. Now what they do is they build a model and they have uh, predictions. Uh, within a certain envelope of anticipated reactions, what are our competitors going to do, what are our customers going to do, what are our students going to do, what are our politicians going to do, what are the politicians of other countries going to do, etc. And build presentations <coughs> on the basis of that. So many uh, corporation now is run just on PowerPoint, basically, on scenarios. And scenario building was something uh, that the 60s uh, really, really built up. Um, I can't go into the details here, but there's a lot of really interesting stories, for instance, to be told about Buckminster Fuller, who was the first person, long before Helding, wanted to have a planet-sized simulation. Buckminster Fuller wanted to build a world game, and he actually traveled around the globe as a um, sort of roving consultant. Uh, still people uh, offering a global simulation, OS Earth, at the URL worldgame.org. I was trying to bring them here to campus uh, for a few years now, but they want to charge me $10,000. And I figured, I like you guys, but not that much. <laughs> World game uh, for Fuller was still going to be a map, sort of tabletop floor game. Uh, he had a convection, sort of, um, he had a projected, projected out uh, the various plots of the earth, the various parts, the various things that are uh, fought over or debated, and he was going to have people actually stand on a real scale map. Like, uh, you'd, you'd use a stadium, you'd use a gym hall, you'd use an uh, assembly hall, and have people act out in real time, play acting, uh, simulate uh, various things. And uh, Fate of the World, which is a new strategy game launched two years ago, uh, does much the same thing. It doesn't charge you $10,000 for it either. Uh, of course, there uh, are still various arms of the government that do that. In fact, they do it for various purposes. Um, the Technical Support Working Group uh, supports various uh, branches of the US uh, military and other parts of government for risk uh, consulting on chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear countermeasures. <coughs> um, there are training programs. There's the MOVES Institute, Modeling Virtual Environments and Simulation Academic Program at the Naval Postgraduate School uh, that educates warfighters. Um, Air Force, um, Navy, um, Combined Forces, they all have simulation centers. They all use uh, that. Uh, computer supported discipline uh, to train people, to inform people, to play war games, strategy, simulations, futurism, anticipating, and this has also become a commercial and even uh, a higher ed kind of thing. Uh, last year there was a big convention in Virginia Beach that asked gamers, techies, and tweeters uh, to come to uh, the Mod Sim World Conference and Expo. So these are the strands that come together in trying to understand what is this Helbing guy talking about when he says he wants to have an international group of scientists build basically a full-scale simulation of all the critical systems of this Earth, of this planet. 
And he says, many problems we have today, I quote, including social and economic instabilities, wars, disease spreading, are related to human behavior, but there's apparently a serious lack of understanding regarding how society and the economy work. When a sociologist says that, of course, a lot of people say, are you an epidemiologist? Are you an economist? He's not even a computer scientist, is he? You know, what, what are these coalitions of international scientists that you're going to need? That's why you justify a billion euros in the grant. Uh, how many people are you going to need? How much expertise are you going to need to build an accurate sim earth uh, that's going to actually work? Um, if you're a sci-fi buff, you know that uh, Foundation series by uh, Asimov already had a character like that, Harry Seldon, um, who had um, written the book of rules for how to simulate everything, you know, kind of a prediction scientist, a futurist. And unfortunately, most of the press that Helbing is getting is kind of in the vein of, oh, he wants to be in an Asimov book. Uh, but I think he's much more serious than that. What he wants to bring together uh, is identify the grand challenges from a global perspective and do a lot of social data mining and social simulation. Right? So it's um, about the same thing, but much more ambitious as you going to Facebook and saying, you know what, every time one of my friends says uh, in their status update, perhaps, uh, that they're feeling under the weather, I think everybody who's connected to them on the social graph should be alerted. Maybe, maybe you don't have to tell them, but maybe that's a privacy issue. But it isn't really if you update your, your Facebook status saying, I have the flu. Uh, you've given the information away. You know, what, what can Facebook do to prevent the outbreak of right, whatever it might be? And if it's just a flu, still, it could be useful on a campus to avoid the spread of the flu. It doesn't have to be Facebook. It could be Google Plus, if you like that. Any take <laughs> Uh, or it could be whatever other way that you are you know, in touch with uh, people, Twitter, um, uh, MySpace, uh, or games, or uh, Triple E, for goodness sake. You know, it could be anything. And then you would bring these things together in a crisis observatory where, this is too small for you to read, but I'll read it for you. Helbig claims that the computer system once assembled, it's going to take him until about nine, uh, 2022, 10 years, could predict infectious disease outbreaks pinpoint specific ways to combat climate change, and even foresee financial crises. Discuss. Mm -hmm. How much of a chance do you give them? I don't, I don't know. But it doesn't sound reasonable. Okay. Anyone else? I have a question. Okay. Uh, how are you supposed to be able to simulate world events? Like, uh, I know this says they're going to get a bunch of computers and do some number crunching, but yeah, I have something more specific on how you go about you know, predicting maybe a disease outbreak. They say that future ICT, which is what they call it, Future okay. Information Computing Technology, okay. Knowledge Accelerator is going to integrate the best of all relevant knowledge. Okay, so they're going to collect a bunch of data. Also, are they going to be collecting continuously? Because I don't think that you can collect a whole bunch of data about the world at one given point and have some kind of map mathematical model good enough for all this initial data to be enough to predict everything that's going to be happening in the future. I think for this sort of thing you need to continuously you know, get data from everywhere. And uh, I don't know if that's included in the initial you know, 1 billion euro cost, but I think that's something to keep in mind too. Uh, you know, just saying. Another thing too is that as for uh, solving you know, those equations for fluid mechanics and things like that, they're not really solving them, they're just coming up with uh, numerical results. You can't really solve those kinds of things. And you know what I'm thinking is that if it's so difficult to actually be able to, you know, maybe solve an equation for like a fluid in a pipe, if if you know there's no way to totally you know get that down, how can you, you know, basically write an equation for the entire you know course of human events starting at one initial point and going on? Like I don't see it happening, you know. Sorry to say that, but that's you know, uh, <laughs> no, no, I don't disagree with you. That's not really a question, but I, you know, I can only agree. <laughs> Let's put it this way. Let's put it this way. If you could have that, if you could have this for a billion euros, that would be a bargain. 
<laughs> and but which kind of <laughs> company is interested in this and has a billion or a couple? I already mentioned Facebook. Google. You think it would have gone for it? I, mean, yeah, I could mention Google. They have that. Apple has that cash. They would go for it. Microsoft. Any kind of company that has serious computing capacity. I don't think they would just that has a lot of data mining. I think you need to you uh, you know to kind of uh, make absolutely sure that you know. I mean, like, okay, it'd be good to have some kind of like evidence that something like this would work like on a smaller scale. I mean, like, I know there's like other kinds of simulation, but um, you know. On the other hand, don't underestimate what's possible, right? That's why I went through the four and a half different strands that have given us what we do now with simulations. Right? Um, there was science fiction anticipating a nuclear bomb about three decades before physicists seriously started working on the problem. Right? They had actually read this as kids. This, uh, for instance, H.G. Wells, who you know as a sci-fi author, had written uh, a book that includes the idea of a nuclear bomb. And it was a very popular book for people, especially in Britain. They may have read it as kids. It may have registered somewhere in their uh, not yet physicist's brain. And then it was only a couple decades later when they had computers that were powerful enough to make those kind of calculations. And they said, you know what? We, we may make this tractable. Right? And we do have a lot of data mining going on. We do have a lot, a lot of computing power that sometimes lies dormant. I mean, for God's sake, I'm using the latest Apple laptop to show you pictures. You know, that's not a very good use of a real computer. Right? It could do some real work while we're talking, right? So, you know, that's what, that's what the SETI at Home project and other projects have tried to tap into. We have a lot of computers. They run more or less at full power. They use a lot of electricity. They have a lot of processing cycles. We could put them to some kind of collective use. Right? That's the ambition that this project has. In the same way in which in the 40s people put to serious applied math and, and, and theoretical physics use, you know, what are we going to do with uh, fission or, or uh, whatever. So, you know, there are breakthroughs that we kind of relegate and say, ah, oh, that sounds like sci-fi, that sounds like Asimov. In the, way, in the same way in which in the 40s people said, oh, that sounds like H.G. Wells. Yeah, but it, they made it happen anyway. I think there's kind of a distinction between like uh, you know physics where I mean you hope any you know like the laws are basically constant like you know on on the scale you know you know what the laws are so you kind of know what's going to happen as opposed to you know human events where I mean I haven't heard of you know any kind of uh, formula that will you know predict what people will do I mean that's a, that's a pretty big leap is what I'm saying that's uh, that's a huge point right even if you could leave people out for a moment right. Take just one of these problems, namely the global warming kind of thing. You know, even to make a, a plausible model at that scale, you have to realize that even in the 50s, people already knew you can use computers to model fluid dynamics, even at the planetary scale. It's going to be okay for the next few hours. <laughs> it's going to be really crammy for the next few weeks. And then it's going to be kind of okay again for decades, right? which is why cosmology, for instance, works. Right? You can predict certain large-scale things in a long horizon. You can also predict them in a very short horizon, just like you know what's most likely to happen in this room in the next 10 minutes or next hour. Right? And they here with more experience in this room may have the extrapolation to say, oh, it's most probable that I know what's going to happen in this room for the next week because they're involved in making things happen. But none of us can say the next five years. Some of us might say, oh, I'm pretty confident I know what's going to be here in 100 years, namely not this building. Right? You, you know what I'm saying? So what, he, what he's trying to make tractable is use all that computing power, use all the data mining, cast aside the worries about how unpredictable humans are, and then say, in the large data, in the mass, People are not that unpredictable because it becomes that kind of large scale, like, you know, maybe you're unpredictable. I'm certainly more unpredictable, I'd like to think, right? We all would like to think that we're more unpredictable than all our marketing data betray. But collectively, your credit card co uh, company knows what a person like you is likely to do. My credit card company certainly knows, right? So does Google, 
so does everybody who advertises to you in your browser, okay? and sometimes it's wildly inaccurate. My wife always uh, is very amused when she gets ads that are targeted very clearly to a 20-something male. Um, <laughs> It's just because she loves sports, right? So she's always Googling sports results, you know. But it's very crude right now, but data mining is happening. Computing is powerful. Make it tractable for these large-scale problems. You know, it's not totally implausible, even though you're totally right with your objections, and I'm with you on the objections. Here's another objection. Apparently, the only thing that's relevant in education is online education. So I'm going to get rid of this slide. Um, <laughs> What they want to bring together, though, is demographic data, transport data, you know, mass transit, uh, geographic data, etc., large-scale data, then model things, <coughs> then go beyond the agent base where you say, oh, I can kind of predict what a person who is 20-something or 30-something grew up in the west of the U.S., grew up in the east coast of the U.S., grew up in the south of the U.S., is going to like, buy, do, etc., right? Marketing companies are in the business of doing that. Right? And they have the slides to prove it. Uh, scale that and make it a forecast that goes much beyond the kind of slicing and dicing. The slicing and dicing <laughs> is being done because that's where you can sell the data bit by bit to Walmart or to uh, Starbucks or whatever. Right? Whoever is going to make a decision whether or not they should have an additional Starbucks on your box. Or whether the two Starbucks at the end of your block are going to be good enough. And um, make it not about those localized decisions, but try to make it about global decisions. There are no systems that we have in place that are very good at global decision making. And that's why the simulation history is being involved, because wargaming was about that, right? before it was black box. When you can see the whole thing on the floor or on the table, you see how the whole system works. Maybe you will make some things in order to make it fit it to your chessboard or on your table. Right? It's an abstraction, but you can, you can see the whole thing. These days when you play on a computer, then you have all the rules kind of uh, stashed away. It has some downsides, right? So war games give you the strategic vision. They're driven by as much data as you have. They're about command and control, being the one who can make the decision. I'm going to do this. I'm going to have this happen but they tended to be really slow and abstract. Flight simulators, mostly about safe training, very good at exploiting feedback. Right? Um, they're, of course, about optimizing survivability of using planes or whatever, but it omits variables. Right? It, it necessarily omits uh, the presence of weather or of other planes, etc. Once you get computerized from here on, with equation-based, agent-based, or what Helming wants, you can have much more complex calculation with heavy computation in real time, or almost real time, which gives you the idea that maybe this is not just about everything now, 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 now casting, but just forecasting. You know, I can predict. You know, this plane is not going to deviate completely from the probability. It's going to do this, therefore, if I shoot there, I'm going to take it down. You can anticipate. But it black boxes certain parameters because it necessarily has to automate a lot of things. Remember the polling of the radar installation, the, the SAGE, right, the defense uh, mechanism, etc. Once you distribute that and you say, you know, the student says, we don't really know how people behave, let's try to build a little box that behaves as closely to what we observe in our students as possible. A little bot, a right, little agent, software agent. Now, what do we do if how many people are in this room? What if 25 of these bots interact? Right? Little agent-based model. Right? Uh, many of you may know that from biology or from epidemiology or from other kinds of models. It's very good at predicting certain types of individual behavior, but it doesn't scale. Politics and political science have been using this for a long time. Game theory, software. Um, how, 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 how accurate has that been for them in predicting elections? They, they didn't even see that the CyberSim uh, project in Chile wasn't going to survive a year. So a large knowledge collider wants to build a global model, use heavy data mining, 
in real time, as a lot of computer-based uh, enterprises already do, apply it to large-scale, very messy situations. Of course, the downside or the offside is that when you totalize that way and you want to attract, uh, you want to uh, attack a global problem, you kind of lose the definition. You want to do everything at the same time. Right? Economics, wars, illnesses, all of it. If you don't do that, then you don't really have a full model of the whole planet and its complexity. So science has for a long time, especially hard science, have been about breaking the problem down into smaller and smaller boxes, making the boxes tractable, and then building back up and saying, okay, now, from a molecular level or from a you know, minute by minute level or from an atomic uh, level, sub uh, molecular level, we can build up our knowledge. And he wants to invert it and say, yeah, that gets us tractable in hard science, but here's some soft science problems, like genocide or like infectious diseases. How do we make the large, large scale uh, something that we can simulate, something that we can calculate, where we can say, computer, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if? Right? Um, example that I often use in class is, you know, if it was not allowed to eat in class here, Usually when I give a talk, it's not allowed to eat. Um, people can smuggle in their sandwich. Right? Let's say a sandwich on campus costs, what, five bucks? Round down, round up. And they could have a bet. And she says, if I get to eat the sandwich and not be called on, you pay. But if I'm called on, I pay. Simple bet, right? People make that kind of bet in my classes all the time, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> because they know I like it. And then, um, <coughs> what if she just feel like eating the whole thing? What if, what if it's not good, or you know, she gets a call, or she gets nervous, and she's like, Ooh, maybe there's other consequences, not just losing the bet, but he could put me on the spot, or give me a bad grade for attendance, or whatever. So you want out of the bet. Classes are 80 minutes, but I'm not going to make it easy on you. You're not 40 minutes in. Maybe you're only 30 minutes in. Or maybe it's not half the sandwich. How does he evaluate the value of the bet now? What's his stake now? You know, you can't just say, oh, it's 250. It is neither half a sandwich nor half the class. Right? So already, you don't know how to calculate it, not even back on, uh, back on the envelope. A computer very easily could say, ah, here's your risk factor. You know, you have this much time left. Is your risk going up or not? She suddenly now considers more risk factors, so maybe for her, the opportunity cost has gone up. For you, you know, you're, you're going to have to calculate how much is it worth to her, how much is it worth to me, so they come out well. Right? Because you didn't come to class intending to pay for that sandwich in the first place. That's why you made a bet instead of giving her the money. Right? Computers are very good at taking this what if, what if, what if chain, calculate it very quickly for you and giving you the answer. And that's what this simulation at the large, large scale is about. What if we could find a way that most people in China and India don't buy a car in the refrigerator, thereby contributing to what we think is a greenhouse effect what, that would uh, make things worse for global warming. What if there was a way, right? How do you scale it? How many people would have to participate in the alternative to, what if you could make computers more green so that they wouldn't cost as much in energy, which causes, et cetera, et cetera. How do you model it? It's a very complex interaction. You know, and as you pointed out very forcefully, you can't predict human behavior that accurately. They've rolled out in some communities in Southern California uh, various meters that try to help people with uh, electricity and power, uh, power use. They've rolled out some strips here on campus that power down if there's no motion in the room. Of course, they put the motion detectors in my office so that if I don't wave, it turns everything <laughs> off. Because, you know, usually I don't wave when I'm sitting on my computer. So, uh, there, are, there are problems. How do you predict how much people will move, etc.? Right? So you got to model that. You got to scale it up, and then the large knowledge collider intends to integrate all of these different uh, strands and give you a total simulation. That's where we are right now. So, generating more questions and answers. Generating a lot of skepticism, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions that you wanted to put into the hamper? Mm -hmm. Paul is going to solve them for you in the next two weeks. <laughs> <laughs>
Where are you going to go with this research, Peter? What? Mm-hmm. When I'm done, I will tire. <laughs> Where am I going to go? Project. What, what, well, as I said in the beginning, partly this comes out of and goes back into my classes on computer history, mm-hmm. on computer games, mm-hmm. and um, part of it is going to go into the direction that I haven't explicitly mentioned, but uh, is implicit here, and it has to do with um, our attitudes towards weather and climate, uh, where there's a lot of media representations. That uh, if I asked you what the weather is like right now, you, you'd look, right? I mean, yeah. you, you kind of know because you came in, but it's not ambient temperature, you know. Uh, people have apps on their phone that tells them, oh, you know, I, I have friends in New York, and, and there's a heat wave on the East Coast, and I know what the temperature is. It doesn't really make you feel what it's like, nor does it tell you accurately what it's going to be like next week. If you're planning to go up to the Bay Area next week, Certainly not that predictable. It's more predictable down here for some pleasant reason than it is in the Bay Area. Um, there's a lot of visualization, a lot of use of media. I'm um, very interested in the data, but I'm more interested in the way in which uh, media images, you know, whether it's the weather report or the graph, uh, the curve, you know, makes these kind of things plausible, tractable, and sometimes they're wrong for certain reasons that are more interesting to me than how people get it right. Mm -hmm. Which is why I'm not necessarily withholding at all, even if he were to give me, which he wouldn't, uh, part of his billion euros. euros. (laughs) Uh, I'd be much more interested in seeing, you know, how do you use images to persuade people to give you a billion euros? (laughs) So, three uses that I see for, you know, two are directly related to what I'm teaching, you know, computer history in general, and then computer games in particular. And the third one is more about how do we understand these large-scale situations and make them something that people can see on a screen, even the, even the phone screen. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. I don't think we're going to answer any final questions about simulation, but I think um, faced with these kinds of projects, and I've run into other projects where people are, Facebook, for instance, offers you access to some data without uh, identifying uh, information for those kinds of large data kinds of problems. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people in epidemiology working for the UC have asked for the, that, that kind of access. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm not an epidemiologist, but I'm interested in you know, what does that mean for our use of media? What is that? How accurate is it? Mm-hmm. Uh, do people really volunteer the kind of sneeze information that you think they have on Facebook? Mm-hmm. I've never updated my status saying I have flu. Uh, but maybe Facebook is relatively good at knowing, you know, it's been not updating the status. So maybe, you know, we want to look at some other data, etc. You know that um, browsers give data about where you click and how often you click, etc. So you're much more tractable as a data generator uh, than you sometimes realize. And the, all of this data have potentially some use. Um, when you talk about data making for social issues, um, how do you, how do you like, determine the, the accuracy and the culture and the data? How do you qualify the data? How do I? How do you like, qualify the data? Is there like, a, 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 a standard that. No. Because all the data. Sure that our simulations 
get as close to reality as possible. They try, they try really hard to go back and see what they did accurate or not. But yeah, it's kind of something where you really can't tell how good a person can be until they actually come along. That's just kind of like <coughs> trying to predict the future. So using using the, the unaccurate data, we're going to get the lot of accurate Well, there are two approaches. Paul's interested in business as one of his majors, and so I've given him a number of uh, things to read about how uh, people use uh, this simulation and scenario building in business. Uh, famous uh, Shell strategist, Shell for the big oil company, uh, didn't take it your way and said, where do we get the data so that we can understand what's happening? Uh, but put it the other way around. And for a long time, people got away with this until now that, that method has been quickened. And they said, and just said, we're going to build a model that says, you know, this is what we think is a way of catching the data that we want. Right? It was not a totalizing model. But the scenario building that Herman Kahn did, um, that Shell does, that other corporations do, that you know, McKinsey and other consultants do, is very selective, it's very filtered. You know, it's like the expertise of knowing, you know, is it relevant to that? People sneeze, or is it just relevant for my project that uh, they say uh, had to go to the ER, etc. Right? You filter some health data, you filter some business data, you filter some economic data, and you don't take it all. You don't take all the clicks on the screen. You just look for certain events. And Shell was extremely successful, not just running its business on that, but training its future executives with that IP of Schwartz from when they first hired to when they. So he became kind of a business legend uh, in that way. Simply by saying, I have a black box. So this would be more or less proprietary. He's since written a couple of other lines. So we can read after the fact, which is why this is mostly now a historical problem, at least for the first half of the summer. And then we can try to extrapolate. It's risky whenever you make kind of predictions to say, how oh, is this going to uh, look next year? I let young people like you guys do that. I'm too old. I'm stuck in the past. But, um, Businesses need to extrapolate. They always plan, right? But they can just plan. That's why I say, this is my model. This is my business model. It's called a model, right? And I simulate the behavior of competitors and, and uh, clients or customers as best I can. And if I see that my competitors are going to take the customers or my customers are going to do this, maybe I'll have to change the model. Right? So that, was, that used to be the, you know, it's not an answer to your customer. Basically, it used to be the, the attitude, my box is going to do something. And it filters data for me. And I don't have to be the total business. I don't have to be a planetary business. I just have to be a successful business. Until people scaled that to a corporate model, where now increasingly, uh, with a winner take all model in, in particularly computer driven uh, industries, you have fewer and larger players. And, you know, in social media still, the landscape is very fluid. You know, Facebook may be big here, even though it's mostly big and making negative uh, headlines, uh, but it's not dominant in China. Uh, Twitter may be big here, but it's not dominant in Europe, etc. So there's, there's other players. And in order to do what helping does, is you have to work with all of these. They don't even talk to each other very well, but they have to all have to talk and play nicely with their children. Um, or at least you know, 10,000 scientists from different universities would have to do that. And then your question is very good. Why take it off? Why, why not have some kind of um, Particularly for the type of research that I do, it's very natural to say, I'm going to have a filter. Maybe you call it a bias, but I have a filter. I'm interested in certain things and not everything. And I'm going to only catch certain data and not all of the other day. Um, for helping the totalizing thing is part of the ambition is that we have planetary systems, planetary problems that are not tractable unless we look at everything together. It's like a holistic approach. And in that case, you're dealing with, uh, I don't know how many terabytes of data per hour. And maybe he can harness a, a computing um, power. But it's not clear to me you know, how you get to, and this is our problem as well for this project, how do you distill that data and turn it into a meaningful question that a human can understand? 
you know, maybe the questions can be understood by computers already, uh, but on a human level, you know, in, a, in the same way in which the interface technician in Sage needs to understand what the system is telling, needs to make the decision, friend or foe, do I shut it down or not? Right? So it, it needs to rise to the level of meaningful decision making for a human, who can then say, I'd like to have a lever that I can pull so that the whole planet would do this. And that's what Paul's going to do. <laughs> <laughs> but only if he finds the answer to your question, which is, how do you filter the data and avoid it them? But that's the essential question about big data. We're generating a huge amount more than we have systems that make them tractable and comprehensible. We can visualize them. Uh, but we don't necessarily know how to control that. Right? You can see energy use in Southern California. Um, and then all of a sudden you see that it leads to a brownout or whatever. You can see water use in Southern California. But you don't know what do I have to do to control water use in Southern California. There are many little behavioral levers. There's not one model where you can say, oh. okay. Whereas if you play sim something, or uh, tycoon, right? Southern California tycoon, then you can say, I hereby decree that people will not use their showers after 9 a.m. Maybe that will do something. You can, if you could simulate that and get a good result, then maybe you can convince a politician to propose that. It's complicated. But it's a really good question. I think that you need data filters. A lot of other people who work with big data say, no, we want them to be as unfiltered as possible, as long as possible, so that you don't introduce your own bias in your own system. Because you're not, you know, Helding is a sociologist, he's not an economist, he's not an uh, epidemiologist, etc. So he shouldn't introduce his questions to her. They should be left to run so that the planet uh, system can show what the water is. I still think that Asimov is more interesting about this than Hilding, but we'll see. I'm not telling you that the result of the project won't be just when you read science fiction. But I did make him watch some sci-fi in the 70s, I believe. <laughs> World on a Wire is out on Blu-ray with English subtitles. And it was made by uh, a very good German director in the 70s. And it is based on the idea that the main character finds themselves in a simulation and finds out that they're actually part of the simulation. It's long, but it's, I think, worth watching. At least Paul said that Anders sold it after he watched it. <coughs> Was the Truman Show a remake of that? You got it? Was the Truman Show a remake of that movie? Uh, 